Yeah. So my name is Aaron. I'm one half of Root in New York. And um, my background in farming comes from uh, the past 12 years or so uh, in Colorado, cultivating cannabis. Um, so I've done that on basically every scale you can think of. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> um, yeah. So my, my cannabis cultivation backgrounds, uh, anywhere from my closet and a four by four grow tent, like where I got started all the way up to hundreds of acres outdoors and millions of plants. Um, I've grown in large commercial greenhouses, uh, and warehouse facilities for production in the legal market in Colorado. So, um, when I'm speaking today, I'm speaking from my experience only, which is, uh, different from everybody else in this room. And we know we've got a lot of valuable experience and smart people here. So we're stoked to, uh, to hear from you guys a little bit today too, about your gardens and, and what you're doing. And, um, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can from our perspective. Um, my background, one, one more thing important about my background, since we teach living soil and natural farming methodologies here, it's important to note that um, most of my commercial production experience has actually been in hydroponics and um, inert mediums, soilless mediums like cocoa core and peat moss. And it was only about seven years ago that I switched over to living soil and really learned how to, how to um, cultivate in soil. And um, we know that some of you guys might be interested in making that transition if you don't already grow that way. Um, we know some of you are probably gardeners and farmers of your own vegetables and food. Uh, so when you're outdoors, a lot of this is going to apply to you in your own uh, home gardens and things like that. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that the experience I have comes from both areas and I've done like small and commercial production at large scale with all of these different methods. So, you know, living soil uh, isn't the only thing we know about. And when we talk about it being advantageous and being a great way to do it, we're coming from a background of having done it the other ways too. And we know that this is a, a really great way to do it. That's why we advocate for it. So, and who, who I am, I'm Bryn and my experience is just totally different. I don't have that much experience in cannabis at all. I actually am a fourth generation from a dairy farm in Pompey, growing crops <coughs> and raising animals. Uh, but I'm really passionate about being good stewards of the land and regenerative farming and taking care of our planet. And then, so when I met Aaron and we started this business, it, it was like, we came together on that passion and now I'm starting to grow cannabis and I'm into it. But <laughs> I definitely have different experience, but the same level of passion, I guess, is what I would say. And I hope that some of the people as you come to these classes and maybe some of you here today aren't necessarily growing cannabis. Maybe you're growing for your market garden. Maybe you're growing crops for your livestock. We can share that type of experience here, too, um, to help each other all be better at what we're doing. Yeah. Bryn also has an education background. Oh, yeah, that's true, too. Uh, and public speaking and graphic design and all of those things. Those are the kinds of things that I add to our business. I manage our website. I do those kind of things. So, yeah. So that's who we are. And um, I would love to know who you guys are. Maybe show of hands or something. Who's growing weed? Cannabis. Yes. Cannabis. Okay, about about half. So um, I'm assuming a lot of people are here home gardeners as well. Also about half or more, which is awesome because we got overlap. Um, any any commercial farmers here growing for a living? You guys, awesome. What do you guys grow? Uh, cannabis and various other crops. We were one of the first like six years since we've been cultivated this year. Oh, nice. Awesome. Congrats. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you guys are together. My business is the boy farm and all sweet. Me and my wife run a small market farm. Last year was our first year, but we spent oh, 10 years farming and we were kind of farming the whole time. Just trying to get better at it. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I'm so glad you're here. That's, I would love to see more of that, like just in general. I want to have 
you know, a homestead and grow food and that's what yeah. we want. So before well, I'll give you a little background. Before that, my wife were Costco owners, we owned a Costco box. And we're just really passionate about all, all, all that good stuff. So uh COVID hit and our business was six months old at that point. It was five. So uh. we had five acres and we said we're going for it. And we put up a 20 by 60 greenhouse last year. And this will be the first spring that we're actually going to put a wood stove in this week and get ready to fire up. Oh Hell God, yeah! I dig it. I'm totally inviting myself over. I want to check it out. I want to check it out. It's awesome. <laughs> Munsville. We're gonna go visit. Yeah. I just invited myself. So <laughs> good. Good. <laughs> A little Richard Perkins style action. Yeah. 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 Good for you. That's awesome. We really are homesteads. Yeah. Well, a lot of people. That's great, and a lot of people, us included, have have dreams like that. Like we would love to grow most of our own food. You just know what's in it. Same with cannabis. When you grow your own, you know exactly what went into that and how it was done versus what you can buy unless you know who you're buying from and who grew it. It is a crapshoot. And let me tell you, I've been behind the scenes of large scale production and you would be appalled. It's like working at a restaurant and finding out that they put stuff back on the plate after they drop it on the floor and things like that. You know, you see all of that stuff and you're like, wow, people are smoking this. That's kind of weird and messed up. And it makes you not want to necessarily buy from sources that you're not familiar with. So just like our food, it's important that we source things locally, we grow things locally, and we're independently sustainable, you know, in, in our communities. Each other too. Yeah. 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 So I'm already loving the feel of the sharing and stuff going on here. Like um, today, just to move into the, the flow of the day, um, we want to really create this as a community, like how we can talk to each other and be like, oh, I want to come visit your farm. And like, let's learn from each other what we're doing that works well and what doesn't and kind of, you know, bring each other up as a group. So the first half of our, of our class today is going to be a quick mini lesson from us on plant health in general. And um, we just got five slides and we'll do a little bit of Q&A, but that shouldn't take more than about an hour. And then we're going to reset the room at that point and make maybe someone can help us with this too. If you guys wouldn't mind helping us at the break, um, we want to rearrange the tables into more of like a circle so we can sort of all like see each other, face each other. We found that that encourages a lot of good discussion and, and idea sharing and stuff. Um, so we'll reset it. And then the whole second half of the event will just be where we get to talk about our own gardens and whatever we're doing right now. How can we? Uh, get some new information that helps us out in our in our grows and, and our farms work together on it, right? Because yeah. Aaron and I are not the end all be all of, it, of anything, really. So we want to use everyone's brains and everyone's knowledge and everyone's ideas and help each other so that we can really be a good community. Yeah, so that's what it'll look like. Um, if we you guys take a break at that point too, so everybody yeah. will get a chance. That was one of the things that we were missing in our earlier classes that we are committed to now. Getting you guys a break. <laughs> um, and then in the second half, I just want to let everyone know that we will have the cameras off for the second half. You will be able to talk about your grows candidly, and it's not going to go on to YouTube or anything. Our, we do share our education bits on our social media and on YouTube and things, but we were not going to do that with our community forum. We're yeah. just going to be able to talk together about what's going on, and you don't have to worry about it going out on YouTube or whatever. Just in case any of y'all are doing illegal shit. Who would do anything illegal? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, oh. Any questions before we get started? Oh, is there something else you want to say? Yes. So, so one more thing. If you guys want to support us, oh, yeah. we, we do try and put these on for free and make them available to the community. And we've got 
stuff for sale like t-shirts and books and things like that. So if you guys want to patronize Rooted, that does help support us and help us keep doing these things in a way that doesn't just lose money and time for us. Um, we'd probably do it anyway, but it's also really nice you know, when people buy stuff from us. So our table's set up over there and you can check out anything we have. Uh, the bathroom. Last thing, the bathroom's just the outhouse right at, right at the end here, the porta potty. Because we on a farm. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you need water, it's right there. Jug, don't get water from the hand washing station. <laughs> Somebody might have been attempting that earlier. No. <laughs> Any okay. questions or anything before we get started? Uh, the farm that you're on out with your poppy. Yeah. Whereabouts was that? So it's the Dennis family farm, Gulf Road and Route 20. Okay. Uh, Craig Dennis is my father. Carl Dennis is my grandfather. I'm a former New York State Dairy Princess. If oh, anybody cares. Where's your tiara? <laughs> I know. I should start wearing my tiaras to the classes, shouldn't I? Oh, God. <laughs> then I'll really upstage you. He's got one too. No, but we could put one on him. I should. I've got, I've got several because I was county princess several times too. So <laughs> I can just. Cannabis root, a cannabis root, uh, a cannabis leaf. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We need to start that. Yeah. I love just it. like Caesar, you yeah. know. <laughs> You're right. That would be so fun. <laughs> yeah. It, so it's kids. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start a scholarship program for young people coming up in cannabis. Well, that's no, that's a, we should sometime. Somebody will. Somebody will. Yeah. All right. So topic of the day is, uh, is plant health. And we're going to use something that I got from, oh, wait. When you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so we're just going to do a quick review of our system, okay? About half of you guys have been here before and have heard us go through the whole living soil, no-till, um, you know, set up how we recommend that you grow. And um, I'll just spend a minute going through what that system looks like. Um, I guess I'll just say, those of you who have not been to our classes before, as we're going through some of this review, if you have questions, please interrupt us. We'd rather make sure everyone's on the same page than keep moving forward and have you be confused. Please interrupt us. We don't mind. Yeah. Okay. So uh, starting with a balanced soil, number one thing. And I say balanced rather than good or, you know, whatever soil, because the balance is really what, what makes your soil productive. And when you grow this way, you can actually have very low levels of, of nutrition available in your, uh, in your soil solution at times, because a lot of it is going to be wrapped up in the life in the soil, which is why it's called living soil. So when we build and design our soil, some of us, if we're growing indoors cannabis, we're going to put it in a container. Uh, and some of us outside will just be testing the earth the, and our beds or whatever setup we have, we'll take some soil tests and then we'll amend accordingly. And the goal is balance. Okay. Um, when the minerals and nutrients in your soil are in balance, what happens is all of the life that lives in there also is in balance because microorganisms and bugs and worms and all of that sort of stuff that makes a living soil alive, that stuff needs balanced nutrition. And it's actually that soil food web of living organisms that feeds our plants in this methodology. So we don't require any use of fertilizer, liquid nutrients, or anything like that. We just build our soil to have the right balance of minerals and nutrition, and then we inoculate that soil with a broad variety of life that will then live there and cycle the nutrition through it, through its life. You know, they'll, they'll eat, they'll pee and poop, and they'll, um, you know, get grazed upon by, by higher level organisms. And all of this, while this is happening, is taking nutrients out of the soil and cycling it through the bodies of the life that lives in that soil. As we do that, those nutrients become available to our plants. And all we have to feed is plain water. We don't have to pH our, our water ever. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So when we advocate growing this way, it's, it's a lot easier than what I used to do, 
when I first started growing, which was, you know, make up a solution of fertilizer each time I had to feed. And it had to be very perfectly balanced and pH'd and everything. Um, <clears throat> and, and it also costs money, which we don't have to spend now. So um, you build the balanced soil, and then we recommend using as a large of a container for this soil as possible. And this is really critical because a lot of people are trying living soil, but they may be growing, used to growing in like five gallon pots or you know, even bigger, seven, 10 gallon pots. Um, but what we recommend is to use as large of a container as you possibly can, because that will buffer any, it buffers a lot of things. Human error for one, if you overwater or underwater, uh, there's a lot less damage that you can do that way. And um, it also allows the nutrients that are in your container to uh, to make it through like an entire round. So, because if you grow a big plant in a five gallon pot, you'll probably notice halfway through your flower cycle or towards the end that plant's going to start getting deficient. There's not enough nutrition in the container for it. So when you use a larger container, you're not going to stress the plant by running out of nutrients or having to switch from a water only biological delivered nutrition to using a fertilizer because you ran out of, of nutrients. So big containers is absolutely huge. It also allows you to use cover crops and interplant other species of things. So that's part of our system as well, is making sure the soil's always covered and has living plants in it, which are bringing moisture to the surface and they're putting sugars and carbohydrates into the soil that feeds the life that's there. That's one thing um, we always want to remember is it's the plants that activate and feed all the biology in the soil. So if you cover crop and companion plant with the right plants, you're going to create a, a good balance of microorganisms in your topsoil to feed your plants with. Um, we recommend mulching as well as cover cropping and companion planting, and then composting and fermentation are things that we use to recycle nutrients from other waste streams and from our own gardens in order to feed that nutrition. This way you never run out of nutrition and you don't have to bring things in from the outside, which costs money, maybe time. It's not the best on the environment, especially if you're like trucking stuff across the country. Um, so recycling waste streams, just like they do here at Taproot, you know, we've got not only our own garden waste, but we also have things like coffee grounds coming from the local, um, the brew shop down there and beer grains from the brewery. We've got the town of Skinny Atlas dropping off piles of leaves that they collect from people's yards all around town. And all of that gets turned into compost here on site. And then we can use that in our soil blends when we make soil, or we can use it as a mulch and a top dress and that's how you keep returning nutrients to your soil. Because when you grow stuff, that takes the nutrients out, right? So we need to keep returning that nutrition back to the soil. And the way we like to do that is by composting, mulching, and also by chopping and dropping onto the soil our cover crops and our prunings. So like if you're pruning your plants... <laughs> You either want to put those prunings into your compost pile uh, to break down and get returned later, or you can top dress them and mulch them right on top of your soil to decompose right there into your soil. Um, then step seven and eight that we also recommend is constant testing and amending because you really just want to know what's going on in there. and. Soil testing is really cheap. It's, it's not expensive at all. And you can then learn to balance and amend your soil based on what those tests give you. Or you can just pay another 30 bucks, which is also really cheap, to have a professional agronomist give you a recommendation. It says your soil is a little low in copper and magnesium. So you should add these couple of things before this season. Question? Another question on that. Is there anybody that you know that's actually <laughs> is like cannabis specific? 
Yeah. So let's repeat the question so that we can. <laughs> the question was, do you know anybody who's cannabis specific for that? Agronomist is like, hey, here's what you actually want. A cannabis specific agronomist. Cannabis wants so much housing compared to everything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I think everything should be based on a calcium. Not a lot of people get it, like how much calcium it actually needs. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the answer is, yeah, we definitely know an agronomist. We use him here to balance our soil that we just made. Uh, he goes by the soil doctor and he's got, it's the soil doctor.com. The cool thing about his website too, is you can get a soil analysis, a soil test done. And he's got a tool on his website where you can just plug in the results, plug in all the numbers. And then for 30 bucks, it'll just spit the recommendation back out for you. And you can even buy the amendments that you need to correct your imbalances straight from his website. So it just makes it super easy. Yeah. Um, you said who that was? Soil doctor. And then also lab testing, uh, Logan Labs. Yes. Really great resource yes. Uh, for saturated base and soil. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Josh, Josh just shared the lab as well. If any of you guys are interested in the lab that we use, it's called Logan Labs. And um, they're really great because the info they provide you is basically everything an agronomist would need to give you a recommendation. So if you want to get a soil test through Logan Labs uh, and you want to have the agronomist look at it, you might want to make a note. The one to get is called the complete test with extras. And that'll give you all of your trace minerals. It'll give you um, your nitrogen release expectations. It'll, it'll give you everything you need for um, an agronomist to tell you what you should do. What about heavy metals and stuff like that? Yeah. 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 Stuff, right? yeah. yeah. Troy just asked, uh, what about heavy metals? In cannabis, especially, heavy metals are an issue in legal markets because they test for that. They actually, you know, good. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to smoke heavy metals. Um, so, <laughs> so the re well, listening to heavy metal is a different thing. <laughs> you can do that all you like. <laughs> um, to avoid uh, heavy metals, you just want to make sure that the amendments you source are not contaminated with heavy metals. So if you're buying them from an agronomist like the soil doctor, he's already done that research to make sure those are good, clean sources. But if you're sourcing your own amendments, you'll just want to look into where that's coming from. Where are they mining it? What's like the guaranteed purities of it? How much of the nutrients you want are in it? And if a place can't provide you with that information, I would say don't buy the amendment from them. Said uh, you were getting your leaves and your mulch from other places. How do you? Uh, how is that process working for you? Yeah. You know, contaminants. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question is that when we're bringing in other waste streams from other businesses or from the town, like we do here, uh, how does that work to make sure those things are clean? Right. Um, trees are pretty safe. Actually, getting getting um, municipal leaf m waste and stuff from a township is is pretty safe because people aren't really spraying pesticides and stuff all over their trees. Just the home, you know, home stuff. Um, so that's a pretty safe one. And then if you're getting stuff from businesses, you just want to check out like where they're getting it. You know, like what are the coffee grounds that you're getting? Where are they coming from? And how are they how are they farmed? Could there be residual stuff on them? And uh, doing that upfront due diligence makes a difference. But also, you can send the compost to Logan Labs to be tested as well. So yeah. we're big advocates of testing all of the pieces and testing the soil again regularly for that reason, too. But really, like even those wood chips, you can get truckloads of wood chips and you're not too concerned about. Wood chips. Uh, Wood chips are a little different. I don't have concerns about contamination with wood chips, but you want to get like certain kinds of wood chips. You don't want to have just like all pine. Yeah. 
yeah. or something like that. So, you, you know, there's free services or you can talk to arborists that will, they don't have anywhere to put all these chips that they make. So you can oftentimes get wood chips for free. Uh, but you just want to find out like what kind of tree it came from is more of the concern I'd have Our there. Our neighbor was taking down a tree this summer and he was like, oh, we need to talk to the tree guy and see if we can get those chips. And of course we missed him. But like, yeah. that's, that's just what we're always thinking yeah. about. Right. So thank you. Yeah. yeah you're welcome. Yep. Cool. You had a question? Um, I just wanted to add to that point about the wood chips. I live in like a very rural area, but whenever I hear like town and county out on the road with their timber, every time I go down there, I'm like, hey, you can sell wood right here. And they're like, oh, no. Yeah. So they don't have to figure like, it out. All the way to a dump. Yeah. Somewhere with like no sense yeah. in the first place. And, and yeah, now I have this like relationship with them. Now they'll like, when they fill up the truck, they just drive up the truck. That's and it awesome. feels good to close those waste streams too, right? Yeah. 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 Also, I just want to just say I really love that we're helping each other here. This is exactly what we were looking to do today. So thank you all for jumping in and yeah. to helping each other with their questions. This is exactly what I wanted from today. Josh. I'd like to add that, you know, these days we do have ash problems, right? There's a lot of dead ash. Some of those aren't being treated, right? And and it's typical every Sort of thing you want to bring in. Yeah. Because it can have detrimental issues for our compound that it brought in and wreak havoc on your farm. And so really you it's it's on it's your responsibility if you're going to try to do this kind of stuff to, to dive in and make this as possible. Because that's really the only true way that you'll ever know. Yeah. And and you don't want to do it after the fact. You want to right. do it right from the beginning because it can already be too late. <laughs> you know, because you already brought stuff in that was contaminated. Now you have a bigger problem on your hands to remove that and then doing it safely or however they need to, depending on what the problem is. But it's really important testing, testing, testing. Yeah. Due diligence up front and then the that, testing that, after. That, that can go a long way. But as others said, it's a great resource for people. A lot of these researchers are trying to get rid of this waste. We have one that can constantly pump stuff. And generally, it's a mixture of, of woods here. We, we live in a really good, uh, great area for trees, and we have a really good, diverse population of trees, which is really nice. And it's a free resource. Uh, but you're right, the, the, uh, the town, you know, they had a non-clean source that were like doggy waste bags, right? And, and other things in there that you just want to be mindful of, ask the questions up front, how are they doing it, how are they getting it, where is it get stored? Uh, but in our case, you know, it's just these materials that come around once a year that people stockpile on their property and want to get on. We will say, mulch those leaves. That's bull for you. Leaf mulch is an amazing thing. Um, we're trying to advocate for people to just mow it, right? Or start your mm -hmm. own pile on uh, site. We know that sometimes there's too many leaves. And you gotta, it's going to choke out the lawn or something. <laughs> so that's a big deal. So just... I'm trying to talk to people and now I'm I know like, Josh, I'm, I'm the same leaves. way. And now I'm not gonna have any leaf balls right <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let's stop yeah. fighting nature though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. A couple of things. Um Omri is a good source for things that they already test for heavy metals. Yep. And then um a couple of things I've read on leaves, if you're gonna pile your leaves to one side. Um, oak leaves aren't as good because they really don't break up. They're actually a coating that keeps them from breaking down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why, and then they just get all pasty and stuck together and they'll kill stuff. Um, a lot of beneficials live in the, those leaves over winter. Absolutely. So if you're mulching with your lawnmower, you might be killing off 
those fireflies you want to see for the 4th of July or mm. the ladybugs you want to come out. Yeah. So you want to be mindful of the balance. We're organic. We have 27 acres. 10 of it's clear and the rest is woods. And that we're very mindful about the insects that are beneficial. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure there's room for them too. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. When you start learning about how these ecosystems work, like you mentioned what lives in those leaves. And when you, when you gain an understanding of it, you kind of just want to leave it alone. The more you learn, you're like, okay, how can I coexist with this and not interfere as much? Because you'll start to see that when you do that, when you operate farms that way or gardens that way, everything just starts to take care of itself. And it's a different type of plant health. It's like a, you know, a natural, hardy, resilient type of plant health that's a lot different than what you get if you're trying to control everything and feed specific fertilizers at specific times or things like that. You know, nature has this figured out already. Yeah. So what we're advocating for is not trying to think we have a better way. <laughs> you know, like let's let's get in harmony with it. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 It's definitely better than taking them off the property and losing all that great nutrition. So that's how nature intended it is for those leaves to fall off that tree and decompose there for the next year's nutrition to be, you know, replenish the soil. Um, go ahead, Trev. Black walnut. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple trees like that. Black walnut is one of them. I, there's another one that's not so good either. Maybe like cypress or something. Uh, black walnut. Butternut. Oh, butternut. butternut. Yeah. Cedar's anti Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is but where doing that research up front, knowing what you have and what your neighbors have and wherever you're sourcing your materials, it's really important. Yeah. A, a quick Google search can tell you which are the best trees and wood chips to mulch, which are the best leaves, which ones might be allelopathic, which, you know, kills off other plants and stuff. Some Go ahead. Can actually make you uh, have an allergic reaction, hand them. Oh, uh, yeah. Nut trees like a chestnut tree. Um, the sawdust from them can actually give you a uh, allergic response. I ended up having to get prednisone because I just swelled up. Oh, wow. Wow. Our, our neighbor gave us chestnut, and I'm cutting it and going crazy. <laughs> Remember that? Uh -huh. Yeah. Another question? Um, I don't know if you can hear Yeah. That's like a place that you can go and sign up. Yeah. Arborists also sign up, and then like there's people looking for chips for the arborist. Yeah. This is a free resource for wood chips, guys. It's called chipdrop.com. You can sign up and have wood chips delivered. Usually they'll do it. I'm assuming you've used them before. Yes. Chip drop, you use them? Um, I, I have, I've been signed up a few yeah. years, but I'm so rural. I, I've never gotten dropped, but I have, I've, I know other people who are yeah. closer to cities. Uh -huh. and I, get, I mean, I know a, guy, a friend who gets dropped probably every month. He gets a huge drop yeah. of leaves, wood yeah. chips, yeah. white and chips. And they'll call you up ahead of time and be like, hey, have this drop them in your area? It depends on the arborist. Some of them yeah. will come. Problem. Some of them might fall. It's pretty like loose system. Yeah, my I've used it. My experience has been that you will put in your request, and then like two hours later, there will be a pile of wood chips, and nobody says anything. It's just like there's so much of them in the city, though, right? Yeah, that was in Denver, so it's a little different than here. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never met anybody in, in yeah. real life in person and just, you know, yeah. say, yes, I use them. Don't worry. I can, yeah. Uh, well, at the, the only issue with chip drop, I'll share this with you guys, is that you can't really choose what kind or quality of wood chips you're getting. It's whatever they got and whoever's there. So I've gotten deliveries from chip drop that I was like, this is not useful for me. Um, maybe it goes into a long-term compost or something, but really not useful otherwise. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, so just a quick summary on this one more time. What we're talking about, this method of growing, begins with building a balanced soil, putting that soil into as big a container as you can, relying on the soil food web and the life in that soil to deliver your nutrition to your plants, planting cover crops and companion plants alongside them, mulching to return nutrition to your soil, composting and fermenting as much organic matter as we can to add nutrition and return to our systems as well. Then we test and amend to keep things in balance regularly. And the last thing I didn't mention yet is a foliar nutrition program, which is a very overlooked thing by many, many growers and gardeners. Plants can take up a lot of nutrition through their leaves. And if you try implementing a foliar system, you'll find that not only does the plant respond and you'll, you'll get a nice reaction from a lot of the different foliar feedings that you can do, but when the plant has the positive health response, it will now start actually providing a higher quality of root exudate into the soil because the plant itself is healthier. It's making more complex compounds and it's able to feed the life in the soil a better quality carbohydrate than it was when it wasn't as healthy. So foliar nutrition is awesome. A lot of times you don't want to put stuff in the soil because it might throw off the balance, but you can spray it onto a plant. And there's all sorts of organic ways to do this that not only will lead to nutrient absorption, but it'll also feed the microbiome that exists on the plant itself, on the surface of the leaves. And, you know, there's a whole world of life, microscopic life on leaf surfaces as well. So when we use foliar sprays, we want to avoid stuff that kills that life, just like we do when we put anything in the soil. And we want to use stuff that encourages that life to thrive. Um, and we're going to get into that now, not foliar specific, but overall plant health and how synergistically you can create a a snowball effect that sort of will ramp your plant's health up um, using the biology around it. Yeah. Yeah. What ones do we prefer to foliar? Go ahead. Well, it depends, right? Um, for example, the last operation I was running in Colorado, we were sap testing every week. So we would get leaves and send them to the lab and they would tell us what is the what's in the contents of the plant sap right now a lot of times it would be a trace mineral that we're a little bit low on something like boron or copper and that's not something you really want to add to the soil because copper will kill biology boron can be really touchy and dangerous if you add too much so these things we actually had organic chelates which is a a product that's got the the mineral or nutrient that you need in the proper form, and then it locks it into that form using an organic acid. So we would spray those based on our sap analysis. We'd look at that and say, okay, we need a little bit more manganese, and we're going to make that adjustment via a foliar spray instead of putting it into the soil. Number one, because it's like instant reaction. Um, when you're dealing with pests, this is a way to to really, you can eradicate entire infestations with plant health focused actions instead of using pesticides, which most of the time don't just kill the thing that you want to get rid of. Right. You know, most pesticides, herbicides, things like that, they're going to kill everything. And then you're left with kind of a sterilized blank slate. And one example, it's not a direct analogy, but I like to say, you don't really hear about people getting staph infections except for in the hospital because that's a sterilized environment and staph is an opportunistic bacteria. I think it's a bacteria. I don't know. <laughs> but the point is when stuff has an opportunity to take hold, that's when it will. So if you clear away all the competing species by using an herbicide or pesticide, now what you're left with is kind of like a blank slate for anything to take hold. This goes for weeds as well. If you're gardening and you want to rid your garden of weeds, 
You can use an herbicide, but now you've got this blank slate and, and weeds are pioneer species. The whole purpose of a weed is that it can grow in less than ideal environments. And when it does, it's going to put organic matter into the soil. It's going to bring life into the topsoil by growing there. And season after season, they'll die and decompose. And gradually, when soil's left alone in nature, interestingly enough, it gets better. It gets richer. If we're not plowing it and disturbing the, the, the life in there, if we're not removing organic matter off it every year, the soil in nature will just naturally get better every year. So whether you're growing outside and want to encourage that natural process, or you're building indoor beds like we got here next door or in your closet, you can, you can run a system where your soil gets better every single harvest. And, then, and it gets easier to grow. The system gets more stabilized. You see less pests, less disease, healthier plants in general. And, um, you know, you kind of you kind of feel like the king once that's going, you know, you're just like, shit, I don't even have to do anything. And everything is just blowing up huge and healthy. And I got big yields of delicious vegetables and and amazing cannabis, you know, and not to mention nutrient density is something that's missing from most of our food today. So when you grow plants in a balanced soil, you're going to get a nutrient dense result whether that's weed or, or vegetables. And that's good for us. That's what we're looking for. Uh, this seems like a good time to move to the next slide, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yucca's great. So the question is, do we like to add anything additional to our foliar feeds? Um, yeah, I add, I add yucca all the time. Um, when I'm not using yucca, sometimes I'll use aloe vera. The reason for that is both of those uh, have a couple beneficial um, components to them. They, they produce saponins, which make kind of a sudsy. That, that's what's in dish soap and stuff like that. That is sort of like a cleaning action. Um, it's good for the plants and it stimulates immune response pathways when you feed that in the root zone or as a foliar. Aloe also has salicylic acid, which is an immune response trigger. And both yucca and aloe are wetting agents, which means they decrease the viscosity, the surface tension of water. So if you're doing a foliar spray, what it is, is instead of getting big droplets on your leaf just sitting there, the surface tension is less, so that droplet will spread out on the leaf surface on a, as a thinner layer, and it'll be absorbed better. So your foliar sprays are usually more effective if you're using a wetting agent. Right? That's so cool, right? So cool. Yeah. Yeah, you can blend up the whole thing. Um, the, the skins may have some stuff in them that, that could be not good. But to answer your question, what I do is I use the, the filet, the inner gel only, um, if we're using our own aloe plants. We also buy a product from Build a Soil that's a freeze dried flake. And so they take fresh aloe, and within like 30 minutes, this stuff is in the freeze dryer off of, off of a commercial farm where they're growing like really high. Um, they're growing aloe that's really high in all the stuff you want in it all the micronutrients, all the, the potent, beneficial stuff. Usually with aloe, that doesn't come around until the plant is like three to five years old and pretty big. So I don't grow aloe plants like that myself. So sometimes I like to use the product that comes from like the good aloe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's just a quick review guys. And there's, we could endlessly talk about living soil and <laughs> we have, and that's what I was yeah. going to say. Our last class was on uh, soil building and maintenance, and it is available on the taproot fields. YouTube channel. And it's the whole class. It's like three plus hours long. And we really go into all of the things that we just covered in review in much greater detail. So you should check that out if you have more questions. Of course, we're happy to answer more questions. But that might give you another baseline for that if you're still not sure about all the things we were just talking about. Yeah. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to breeze through this with that 
with that foundation laid, okay, of what we're talking about when we're talking about using living soil and biology to deliver our nutrients, this pyramid is from a fairly famous agronomist. His name is John Kempf. And uh, you guys should check him out. I highly encourage you to check him out. He created this thing called the, the Plant Health Pyramid. And I think it's just a really awesome way to look at plant health. It, it, when you view plant health through this lens, I think you, you, have a, you get an understanding of what's happening and why. And also, it puts the gardener's focus on the things that really matter, the things that make a difference. So he's got the pyramid of plant health divided into four levels. And it's a pyramid because each one builds upon the ones underneath of it. So when we look at like complete photosynthesis, it's pretty obvious that photosynthesis is what drives plant health at a base level, mm -hmm. right? So if you don't have good levels of complete photosynthesis happening, you're probably going to have, have a hard time synthesizing proteins and, and making lipids. And if you're growing weed, secondary metabolites are what we grow for. That resin is a secondary metabolite. So we gotta have all the other parts of our pyramid in order to really dial that in. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so we're going to talk about what the plant health pyramid is, how we can impact each level, how we can reach each level of it. And then also how the health of the plant correlates with pest and disease resistance. This is a great way to look at it through the, the IPM lens or what we call integrated pest management in a, in a farm. Mm -hmm. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. One of the things that, uh, and then I'll come right back to you. One of the things that made us choose this as a mini lesson today <coughs> is you you all have a feedback form in front of you. One of the things we collect each time we do these classes are the feedback forms. And uh, IPM is one of the things that people wanted to talk about, but we didn't have three hours about it. We had this. And so we are still trying to hit all of the topics that everyone's interested in. And doing these as many lessons is going to be a better way for us to do some of that. Yeah, actually, so this, guys, is this is John Kempf. His agronomy firm is called Advancing Eco Agriculture. And this slide is available right on that website. Yep. And this is the only slide that we have besides our little introductory slides today. So um, if, if you Google Plant Health Pyramid, John Kempf, it comes right up. That's where I found this. Yeah. He's got an hour long video on YouTube that goes through it. And he does a much better job explaining all of this than I'm probably going to do. <laughs> um, not to mention his agronomy firm works with hundreds and maybe thousands of growers on hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres across the country. And they have data to back up everything that they're talking about. So, um, you know, it's just a, it's a really accomplished agronomy firm and um, I've used their products. I've worked directly with them uh, at the last farm I came from. We had our own consultant from Advancing Eco Agriculture and they helped us move through this process using sap analysis and using, um, you know, foliar corrections, but also just balancing the entire system so that we got the max result we could. Um, and I've had nothing but good experience with those guys. So <clears throat> definitely check them out. All right. So the words are kind of hard to read here, but we can maybe zoom. You think I we can zoom? zoom? Yeah. Yeah. And really, we're going to talk about all of these things. It's also prompts for us, which is why they're on there. But I have it here. Where you want to start at the bottom here? Yeah, it's blurry though. That's okay. That's okay. Just leave it there. Okay. Um, so let's talk about level one. And you remember how I said that using this pyramid, I think really helps us focus on the right things. A lot of growers aren't thinking about like, how much are my plants photosynthesizing? And and also, what is the quality of the photosynthates being produced from the process? Because when a plant is doing photosynthesis, what's happening is the chlorophyll molecule is taking in energy from the sun and combining that with uh, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen.
to create carbohydrates. Okay, so this is like base level steps of building life happens. You know, all life is carbon based. The plant is going to get carbon from the air, from the carbon dioxide in the air, among other things. It's going to get oxygen and hydrogen from the water in the ground because it's H2O, right? And then it's going to combine that stuff using the energy from the sun to create carbohydrates. And something a lot of people don't know is that approximately half of these carbohydrates that are made during photosynthesis go directly out the roots of the plants. And these, these uh, exudates, as they're called, are food for the microorganisms and the biology that live in the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is a term for the root zone and the area that's in immediate proximity to it where, where nutrients can be exchanged. <clears throat> so maximizing photosynthesis is obviously going to be really important because if you're producing a lot of carbohydrates and those carbohydrates are also high quality, complex, non-reducing sugars, not the simple ones like glucose, you know, um, gluc that has its place too, and it'll still produce glucose and other simple sugars. But what we want to see is the production of the photosynthates being of very high quality, complex, non-reducing sugars. This can be measured kind of crudely using a tool called a BRICS refractometer. Is anybody familiar with one of those? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So you, you basically squeeze a little bit of plant sap onto this lens, which, which then refracts light through the tool and gives you a reading approximating how much sugar you have in your sap of your plant. Okay. And if it's really high, that probably is a good sign that your plant is photosynthesizing a lot. It's doing, it's doing a lot, right? But what John Kempf asserts in a lot of his presentations is that most of us have no idea what plants look like when they're really photosynthesizing at their peak potential. Most of what we're used to seeing in fields and in our own gardens are plants that are maybe doing 20, 30, 50% of what they could be doing. And we just wouldn't even know that because we're not used to seeing it. So... Um, measuring with a BRICS refractometer is one way. Oh, he's got one there. Yeah. So if you want to see what a refractometer looks like, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> um, so that's not the only way you can also send sap analysis to the lab too, but the real meter at the end of the day is always your plant. Look at it and learn, you know, how it looks and, and what it looks like when you've really got these things maximized. So to get to this level, level one of the plant health pyramid, there are five essential nutrients that need to be available adequately, you know, in order for this to happen. We'll start uh, magnesium and nitrogen, these two here, are both part of a chlorophyll molecule. Every chlorophyll molecule has nitrogen in it. It's got magnesium in it. <clears throat> so if you want to do photosynthesis at a high level, you obviously need those two elements. Iron is not part of that molecule, but it's needed to put it together. So iron is very important for building chlorophyll. Then you've got uh, manganese, which manganese is really cool. It's, it does a lot of really great things in the plant. Um, but one of the biggest things it does is it's essential for water hydrolysis, which is the first thing that happens when a plant uptakes water. It needs to split the H2O molecule into H and O2. So it's, you know, it's splitting that water and then using the hydrogen and oxygen to build its carbohydrates, right? Um, so manganese is essential to hydrolysis. And the last one is phosphorus which is not essential for building or conducting photosynthesis, but it's essential for moving new, for it, moving that energy and the photosynthates around. If I'm, it's a crude description of this, but basically if you, do you guys remember ATP from chemistry and biology, adenosine triphosphate? ATP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ATP is the energy, energy molecule. It's in, involved in energy transport. So the more photosynthates your plant produces, the more ATP you need to move it around. 
So phosphorus is extremely important in reaching level one. Now, the correlate pest and disease resistance effect that you'll see at level one is a resistance to root-borne pathogens and diseases. So we're talking about things like fusarium, root rot, um, pythium, uh, you know, th name, name the root disease. There's a lot of different ones. Um, verticillium wilt, stuff like that. Um, in cannabis, I, don't, I haven't experienced it much. That's maybe a good sign that I'm at least getting to level one regularly. But sometimes I've had plants die and I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, what's going on? And you look around and it's like the stem looks like it got kind of rotted out or wilted. That's usually a root-borne pathogen. And if you've got complete photosynthesis happening, you're not going to have problems with that stuff. So damping off. damping off would probably be in this category as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so level two is... Oh, can what? I go back for just a second? Go ahead. So if you've been to any of our classes before, you know that I sometimes like to make analogies because it makes things a little more accessible for some of us who are maybe not paying attention in biology in high school. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I talk about is that the root zone, the rhizosphere is like a nightclub. And we're getting all that biodiversity there and it's like hopping and it's great. When you have complex car carbohydrates going out into the root exodus, instead of more simple carbohydrates, it's like the difference between the nightclub serving beer and like craft cocktails, right? You're going to get a different type of clientele. You're going to get a different type of biodiversity in your rhizosphere. Your nightclub's going to be different. You get it the rich and cultured. <laughs> <laughs> Instead microorganisms. of Miller Lite, no offense, we're <laughs> saying a sports bar. Cosmos. And it's just, it's, that's how I kind of think of it, right? So I probably am going to do this again. But I, I like to have kind of a simple analogy to make it make sense in my head. So if it helped anyone here, that's how I think about it. Mm. Rise of spheres, plants, hop in nightclub. Yeah. <laughs> See, you look at your garden and be like nightclub everywhere. You need a bouncer or something to <laughs> kick out the bad ones. <laughs> now you can go to level two. Okay, thank you. Root out the bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, complete photosynthesis is the next level, and what's happening here is the plant is taking these these more simple. Uh, ionic nutrition that it's absorbing and it's making proteins out of them. Um, as you go up the chain, you know, you start with like a carbohydrate and then when you combine some nitrogen in there, you get an amino acid and then the amino acids are used to build things like peptides and proteins. And then you go to fats and lipids. And as you move up this chain, it's, these are more complex molecules being assembled from the ones from the smaller ones, right? Um, to have complete protein synthesis, there's again, a few essential, uh, nutrients involved in that. We've got sulfur, manganese again, uh, and magnesium and boron is the third one oh, no. or the fourth one. Oh, it's molybdenum. I'm sorry. M M O is molybdenum. That looks like an N. Uh, <laughs> it's real small. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's something called an enzyme cofactor which uh, is enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. And some of these trace minerals or micronutrients are oftentimes needed to be used as enzyme cofactors in creating these, these larger molecules. Some of them are pieces of these larger molecules. But at any rate, molybdenum and manganese and sulfur, like when you start adding sulfur into the chain, the side chains of amino acids or whatever, I don't know really what I'm talking about when it comes to chemistry, <laughs> but I just have a basic understanding that these are the ones that are needed uh, to, to have complete protein synthesis going on. Boron, as I understand, is not involved as much, but also adds increased pest resistance and disease resistance. So adding it at this phase really gets you there in terms of the effect you want at level two. Um, what that is, is now going to be a resistance to sucking insects and, and larval stuff. So these are, these are things like spider mites, aphids, and thrips are a few major pests for our cannabis growers, right? Um, 
other, other things that just, these things are the ones that poke a hole in your leaf and they suck out the sap. Uh, they also have simple digestive systems. So this is a key thing to know that I didn't even know about until a few years ago. And it, it totally changed the game when dealing with pests, especially spider mites, thrips, aphids, right? Those pests have simple digestive tracts and they are only able to digest simple forms of nitrogen, specifically ammonium and nitrate, which are the, which are the base levels of nitrogen, right? Um, our goal at level two of the plant health pyramid is to see if we were to do a sap analysis, what we would see is that there would be zero parts per million of ammonium and nitrate in the plant, but the plant will still have abundant levels of total nitrogen. So what that means is there's plenty of nitrogen available to that plant, but the plant is rapidly converting any of the simple forms into the higher ones before they can be left sitting around in the plant, which is essentially the food source for these pests, okay? So if you don't have any nitrate or ammonium in your plant sap, you will not have spider mites, aphids, thrips, and that has been proven over and over again in hundreds of, of cases. Um, I have done that myself as well. I have completely reversed infestations of spider mites and aphids and thrips, all three of them, by simply doing a foliar spray that balanced my plant sap. We would test one week. We would say, okay, we're low in XYZ or off over here. We would apply a foliar spray in the middle of an infestation. And then a week later, none of those pests are there. There's dead ones all over the place, just like we sprayed a pesticide, but, it, but we didn't. And what we did actually just increase the plant health to a level where there's no more food left for those pests to eat it. Okay. And it's amazing. The first time I did this, I was freaking out. And, and my clients who I was consulting for didn't want to trust me at first because we were talking about an 80,000 square foot greenhouse. And they're like, we can't take the chance. Like you got to nuke everything. You know, that's normally the response is like, I got some spider mites. I better kill it, you know, kill it with fire. Uh, <laughs> but it, it takes some balls to be like, you know what? No, we're going to rely on plant health to take care of this. We're not going to worry about it spreading throughout the grow too much. We're going to, we're just going to take the actions to increase plant health that we can. And not everybody has the capability to sap test and do this perfectly. I understand that, right? But the point to take home here is that if you have this level of plant health where there's no simple nitrogen in your plant, there's not going to be anything for these simple digestive insects to eat. Um, so that's huge. Go ahead. Are you making your own foliar spray? Not always. Okay. Sometimes, but not always. When it comes to the precise application of specific micronutrients, we're using products from advancing eco agriculture. Okay. Yeah. And those are organic chelates. So, you know, it's like ground up rock dust mixed with organic acids, but it's, it's done in a way that puts it in the right form and it locks it in the right form. So your, your plant's actually going to uptake what it needs in the proper form and you see the right response. And for me to make something like that, I, I don't know if I know how to do it. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, so we have a really bad you know, new mm. property. Yeah. And, yeah. I just kind of made the correlation with what you just said, but we grow our outdoors on a small agriculture beds. Nice. And the first row last year was second year old beds, and then the rest of the whole fence in the area was first year beds. All the first year beds got hit so much worse. Oh, yeah. Second year beds, the plants like hardly got any damage. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so why would you, why, why would you think that is? I mean, I, I don't know the exact reason. It was just healthier soil. Yeah. Right. Healthier. Yeah. Right. The, those first year new beds haven't been built for three years. So, so as your soil health improved, yeah. your plant health yeah. is improving. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get into what's going on in the microbiome to have that happen in the next two levels here. Because what you'll notice 
is the first two levels are chemical dependent things, you know? So, so the, um, you'll see there's like a line there, those bottom two, it's, it's passive immunity caused by balanced chemistry is what it says on the side there. So, yeah. Yes. So, um, when you get to level three and four, that's going to require biology and what's going on in your beds is probably a result of having a, the right balance of microorganisms in your rhizosphere. Um, so level three, what's happening at level three is uh, increased lipid synthesis. So, oh, I do want to say one more thing about level two at the same time, because this is really cool. Imagine, well, it actually applies to level three. Never mind. <laughs> I'm totally confused. So, all right. You I'll just want to hear a level two analogy because I've got one. You ready? Yeah, do it. <laughs> so for me, <laughs> our plant is a five-star restaurant now. Okay. You following me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want six-year-olds coming in and coloring on my tables and running around and being crazy. So I'm going to stop serving chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese at my five-star restaurant. And then people are going to stop bringing their kids because I don't have the food that their kids want. Okay? That's how we're thinking about this. If we stop serving the food that the bugs, the aphids, all those things want, if we stop serving them the food they want, they're going to stop coming to our restaurant. Our plant is way classier than that. <laughs> yeah. So it keeps me around, these crazy, these crazy analogies. Yeah. <laughs> when I get off track, she's like, let me throw one out. <laughs> <laughs> Are you back on track? Yeah, I am. Okay, cool. All right. So <laughs> when we get to level three, what's happening is increased lipid synthesis. And lipids are like fats, you know. Um, the way that you can see visually that this is happening is when you get that waxy sheen on the leaf. You guys know like what that that's called the leaf cuticle. And that's actual lipids being stacked on the outside of the leaf. And what that does is increase resistance to things like um, powdery mildew if you're growing cannabis. This is where you're going to start getting resistance to those airborne pathogens that have spores that need to germinate on your leaf. And then once it germinates, what it's going to do, this is how powdery mildew works, right? Spores on the leaf. And when the conditions are right, the right humidity and, and uh, air and moisture going on there, that spore is going to germinate. It's going to send out a hyphae, which produces enzymes. And the enzymes that hyphae produces are called pectolytic enzymes. Uh, and they dissolve pectin. Yeah. Which is part of the cell wall. Okay. So, so the cell wall gets an enzyme excreted onto it by this fungal hyphae, which dissolves it and allows that hyphae an avenue to burrow into the leaf where it then starts to feed and get the nutrients it needs to, uh, to proliferate and to grow, right? Well, if you got a waxy lipid coating covering the pectin, the enzymes that dissolve that cannot get to it. So you literally can't get powdery mildew when you have this high lipid content on your plant, okay? Now, I will say, these are not all like exactly hard and fast rules. Like sometimes you can get real healthy plants and they still have a little bit of PM or a little bit of spider mites. But with mites and stuff, I would still say if you pulled a sap test, you have nitrate in there. You have ammonium in there probably is why you have spider mites. When you have zero, you just won't with that. But, you know, powdery mildew, it kind of depends like what part of level three you might be at. You know, maybe it's not developed enough to get that full resistance, but resistance to those type of, of things happens at this level. Go ahead. Nice. 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 No. So how is, how are things like that happening? Right. How is your plant getting enough calcium? To, to form its molecules that way. The way that that happens is really only through biological delivery. Uh, 
I have never been into a hydroponic grow facility, you know, greenhouse even, and seen plants that are being fed a synthetic nutrient diet have that total wax coating on their leaves. It just doesn't really happen. And, and that's because biologically delivered nutrition is way more complex than some formula we can bottle, right? Like there's nuances to this that we don't understand. Like science has not been able to figure out these things yet. We don't fully understand how photosynthesis even works still. So the reason why we talk about growing this way is, is because there's a lot of blind spots that we have when we think we know everything, right? That we're going to, we're, we're always missing something that we don't understand. And a lot of it we'll probably never even understand in our lifetime, but nature gets it and it does it if we enable it to. So another cool thing about level three that I'll mention, because here's why it requires biology, right? Imagine you've got a lot of nutrition that's being absorbed from the solution in the soil. That's, that's the water in the soil with dissolved nutrients in it. And those are being uptaken th from the nutrient solution. Well, we know a couple other things too. Number one, plants don't just absorb uh, simple molecules from the soil solution. I think we've studied it and found that plants can absorb molecules with a molecular weight upwards of around a thousand. So that actually includes like fully formed proteins and you know amino acids and on all sorts of things like that. So if if you're the plant and you've got a choice between taking up nitrate by itself or taking up an amino acid that's already built, when you take up the amino acid that's already built, it's like you're absorbing a pre-made part, like a prefabricated part. And the energy that the plant would normally have to expend to convert that nitrate into um, an amino acid is saved. And that excess energy is what gets stored in the fat of the plant. Kind of like as a human, when we take in more calories than we burn, that gets stored in fat. It's kind of the same way. When you get efficient nutrient delivery, which again, cannot happen with synthetic fertilizer. You're not going to, they do make amino acid fertilizers and things like this, but it's nowhere near what you're going to get from the absorption of bacterial and fungal metabolites. What, what it is, is these are, these are metabolites of the biology that lives in your soil because the microorganisms are taking up these nutrients out of the soil first, and then they're living, dying, pooping, peeing, getting grazed on by everything. And those fully formed molecules that the, that the microorganism built in its own body to create its own body and to reproduce and make energy, do all the things it does. Those are the metabolites it produces. And now those are available to the plants only really through biology. So to get to this level, that's why bi biology is really important. Uh, what else is there to say about this? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times we see these levels happening together, but there's a distinction between the top two and the bottom two. Like the bottom two, if you balance your soil chemically, you know, and, and you've got a, a proper balance that way, you're probably going to get these kind of results that'll get you to level two. But once you hit level three and four, you really need a vigorous microbiome in order to get to this point. Um, so level four is the last one. And at this level, you get immunity to the beetle family. So Japanese beetle. If you can get, if you can get up here <clears throat> where there's a high level of production of secondary metabolites, then Japanese beetles, borers, and all sorts, the whole beetle family, you're going you're gonna to have start having some resistance to that. Um, along with viruses to some extent, although viruses... We, it, it, I don't think that there's, you know, and Daniela back there could probably tell us a little bit about this too, but viruses, like, it's not that we get immunity or anything like that. The plant may still be susceptible to getting a virus or it may even have a virus, but 
at level four of the plant health pyramid, what you're going to start seeing is that those viruses will be asymptomatic. Or have higher resistance to yes. both things. Yeah. Um, so like, I, I, here I'm going to analogize again for you all. But like, I've had plenty of sinus infections in my life. So when my kids come home and they're sick and they've got some sort of infection, even if I catch what they have, I'm probably not going to be as ill as they are. Right? Because... I'm a healthier person. I'm an older person. I've come in contact with all of these things before. I'm better able to handle the same strains of illness that take my children out because they're 10 and 9 and they're still building that immunity. Same thing. Your plants have a higher immunity, have a higher resistance to it at this stage. Yeah. And so it's not going to take them out as quickly. Yeah. Saying that okay? Yeah, absolutely. And part of that is because the the immune response pathways of your plants are being triggered by the microbiology constantly. So the more vigorous you have of a population in there, the more these metabolites are going to constantly stimulate the ISR and the SAR um, immune response pathways of the plant, right? Um <clears throat> so also of note is that uh root feeding nematodes will you'll you'll develop a resistance to to root feeding nematodes at this level i don't know if anybody's ever had a problem with those but they can be especially outdoors they can be like really crazy um and like i've i've seen farmers like lose their farm over stuff like that uh when it's real critical so uh anyways that's the plant health pyramid and you know, just just to summarize, like, again, it goes back to the those eight points that we use. All of that's designed to have this result, right? Design your balanced soil, inoculate it with good life, and then feed that life constantly so that all your nutrition is being delivered in a balanced way through and, and in a high level way through the biology. And uh and you'll start to see these, these types of results. And, and this has been, at a commercial scale, this has been my entire IPM. I'm telling you, we did not, we did not spray anything in veg. Um, we didn't, there, there was nothing, nothing else except for, except for plant health foliars. Um, we didn't even use like neem oil or anything like that. And I, and I completed multiple rounds of cannabis production this way, sometimes seeing high levels of pest pressure and being able to manage it, sometimes seeing no pest pressure at all because it's really dialed in. Um, and it's a cool feeling to just know. It, it transforms the way you grow because a lot of us, you know, who here's had the experience of being paranoid about bringing in cuts from other growers? Yeah. Well, like I can honestly say, I mean, I take precautions, but it's not something that I worry about too much because I know that once the plants get in my soil, in my system, there's just not going to be issues. And like we would bring people in like random people to these commercial grow operations and they'd be like, you don't want us to wear like a, like a Tyvek suit and a hairnet and a freaking like gloves and, and a mask and everything. And we're like, no. That's not, that's not what we do, you know, but, oh, it's, what if you're going to track in spider mites or whatever? And it's like, bring them in, throw them on the plant. I don't care. They're just going to die. Like, <laughs> and it might sound extreme. It might sound hard to believe. People question this all the time, especially like, you know, of, of certain uh, teachers out there, like, like John Kempf can be controversial. Danielle is a skeptic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so people question this, but I'm just telling you, I'm not telling you I have all the perfect understanding of the science behind it, but what I do have is direct experience that shows me that this works. And when you have the right balance of life and nutrients and, and minerals that nature just kind of does it. Like I, I don't see the forest getting eaten by aphids. Like, Every once in a while, I'll see some aphids on a plant, but the purpose of, of pests and diseases in nature, I believe, is to call out weak genetics. It's like nature's survival of the fittest mechanism. 
when there's unhealthy plants and unhealthy genes, they're going to get eaten by pests and they're not going to reproduce. So in nature, what happens is that balance is always equalizing itself. Um, and if we tap into that, then you don't have to worry about controlling every last piece of your garden to kill everything you don't want. And it's just a, it's a much more pleasant and peaceful way to grow. You know, just you feel like you're in touch with nature and that you're, you're working together. And it, it teaches you a lot about your own health as well, because we're organisms just like plants are. And um, natural diets, high in, in nutrient dense fruits and vegetables and stuff. If you've ever tried eating that way, it's like, it's a pretty big difference, you know, <laughs> from, from normal food that's out there. Anyway, questions? Like literally, like on his companion or on his cover crop, just cover. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So, in in home gardening or market gardening, this could be like a flame weeder type situation where you've got a cover crop that's getting towards the end of its useful life, and you want to terminate it. When we're growing cannabis with cover crops and companion crops. A lot of times as the cannabis starts to take up more of the canopy and shade out what's underneath it, things like our clover companion crop will start to get less light and become unhealthy. And all of a sudden it starts to get spider mites or aphids on, on, your, on your companion plants. That's not what you want, right? Because you don't want it to travel to your, your regular plants. One way to terminate a crop is, is with flames. You can, and you'll burn all the pests at the same time, I guess. There's, there's a lot of really cool science that's starting to happen around the cannabis space and in just agriculture in general. So I just think it's awesome that we are forming a community like this where we have people from Cornell. We've got farmers that are out in the fields doing it. We've got home growers. We got everything here. And it's just really cool that we get to share with each other like this. 